birds and bees And we want all of them to stay For a healthy soil and a healthy life Say lay, 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 lay la la lay, 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 lay la la lay, 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 lay la la 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 lay, lay, lay Einen wunderschönen guten Abend, liebe Gäste, liebe Freunde, herzlich willkommen zu einem ganz, ganz besonderen Abend hier in Berlin. Ein Abend, auf den wir uns alle lange gefreut haben, ein, ich glaube, für uns alle ganz, ganz besonderer Moment. Und ich sage es einfach einmal so, wenn wir uns heute Abend damit beschäftigen wollen, dass wir uns mit dem Boden mehr auseinandersetzen müssen, dass wir den Boden retten wollen, dann ist das alleine das. Eine so wunderbare Nachricht, dass wir heute Abend so viele Menschen sind. Fast 2000 Berlinerinnen und Berliner aus ganz Deutschland, aus ganz Europa angereist. Herzlich willkommen zu Safe Soil. Schön, dass ihr da seid. Mein Name ist Matthias Killing, ich darf heute durch den Abend führen, aber ich möchte gar nicht viele Worte machen hier zu Beginn. Wir warten natürlich alle auf das, was Sadhguru uns zu sagen hat, was er im Gespräch mit Toni Gahn gleich hier auf der Bühne sagen wird. Und wir freuen uns auf einen Professor des Instituts für Klimaforschung in Potsdam. Auch er wird sich mit diesem Thema, wie wir alle etwas tun können, auseinandersetzen. Und heute Abend haben wir alle hoffentlich mehr Erkenntnisse als vor diesem Abend. Es ist ein historischer Moment und es ist ein historischer Abend auch für diese Stadt, für Berlin. Das Sadhguru hier ist, ich glaube, alleine das ist noch einmal einen riesengroßen Applaus. Welcome to Berlin, Sadhguru. It's such a pleasure to have you here. So we are so happy. Und das ist eigentlich eine ganz schöne Idee. Ihr winkt gerade alle, ihr winkt gerade alle. Wenn wir jetzt gleich nochmal das Bild zeigen, vielleicht können wir alle mal gemeinsam winken. Wenn ihr alle mal winkt, weil ihr euch freut, dass ihr gemeinsam hier seid. Heute Abend, hallo Berlin! Okay. Das ist auch schön, oder? So kann man, aber für mich war es ein wunderschönes Bild, wie ihr alle gesungen habt. Es gibt ein ganz, ganz großes, ein wunderschönes äh, Sprichwort für diesen heutigen Abend und das wollen wir gemeinsam er, äh, einmal hier, ich will nicht sagen erarbeiten, ich glaube, das kriegen wir alle hin. Ich sage, es geht um, es geht um den Body, das Sprichwort lautet my body, your body, body, soil. Das heißt, ich werde sagen my, ihr sagt body, ich sage your, ihr sagt body und dann sage ich body und ihr sagt soil. Wollen wir das gemeinsam einmal machen? Amsterdam, Amsterdam hat da vorgelegt. Ich habe das Video gesehen, ich glaube, das kriegen wir aber noch besser hin. Hier in Berlin ist eine große Tournee, auf der Sadhguru ist, eine Reise, über die wir gleich sprechen werden. Aber erst einmal dieser Wahlspruch für den heutigen Abend. Ich sage, my, ja, body, ja, das ist klasse. Und genau diese Energie wünschen wir uns für den heutigen Abend, für eine Reise, die eine besondere ist. 100 Tage. 100 Tage, 30.000 Kilometer auf dem Motorrad. Ist das nicht ein Wahnsinn, oder? Da geht das Winken wieder los. Ja, jetzt klappt's. Schaut mal hier. Wunderbar. Warum sind wir hier? Warum seid ihr heute Abend hier? Weil wir eine Verantwortung haben. Weil jeder von uns eine Verantwortung hat für die Zukunft. Jeder von uns hat eine Verantwortung für die Zukunft unserer Kinder, unserer Enkelkinder. Aber auch jeder hat eine Verantwortung für das Hier und Jetzt. Und während wir heute Abend zwei Stunden lang miteinander sprechen, wenn wir diesen Abend genießen, in diesen zwei Stunden werden auf der gesamten Welt, und das ist eine unglaubliche Zahl, wie ich finde, 2000 Fußballfelder 
nährstoffreicher Boden vernichtet. In zwei Stunden. Wir müssen jetzt was tun. Wir müssen jetzt in Action gehen. Wir müssen jetzt darüber reden. Wir müssen die Botschaft verteilen und jeder von uns muss etwas tun. Leute, das ist die Verantwortung unserer Generation und ihr seid hier und ihr werdet dieser Verantwortung gerecht und dafür jetzt schon ein riesengroßes Dankeschön. Sonst wärt ihr nicht hier. Ich freue mich darüber, dass ihr da seid. Und jetzt möchte ich gerne, denn Bilder sprechen natürlich viel mehr als tausend Worte, die Bilder sprechen lassen. Wir haben ein erstes kleines Video zur Einstimmung für diesen heutigen Abend vorbereitet. Dieser Abend, der uns hoffentlich alle für immer in Erinnerung bleiben wird. Ein Abend, auf den wir uns alle lange gefreut haben. Deswegen sage ich jetzt noch einmal mit euch gemeinsam. My, your, body. Und dann... Film ab, darum geht es heute Abend. Thousand kilometers, a long motorcycle journey, 
30,000 kilometers across 24 nations to actuate support from the citizenry to assure the government long-term investments will be appreciated. So it's extremely important that soil regeneration is enshrined in the policy of every government on the planet. We must change the narrative on the planet that soil is a wealth, a legacy we have received from previous generations and we have to pass it on as living soil for future generations. We are in a cusp of time, if we do the right things now, in the next 15 to 25 years, we can significantly turn this situation around and regenerate the soil. But if we allow this to progress like this for another 30 to 40 years, after 40 years if we attempt this, then it will take 150 to 200 years because that much loss of biodiversity would have happened. From 21st of March to 100 days, the whole world, every human being on the planet should talk soil. We must hear the word soil, save soil everywhere to see that the narrative on the planet changes towards the most vital aspect of our life, the soil. Each one of you should reach as many people as you can to make this happen. Many global leaders and influencers are already participating in the movement. Be a part of this and let us make it happen. Let us make it happen. Was für ein einfacher Satz, in dem so viel Verantwortung steckt. Und ich weiß nicht, wie es euch geht. Ich habe jetzt, während ich diesen Film gerade noch einmal gesehen habe, viele, viele Gedanken gehabt über Verantwortung. Ich habe aber einen Gedanken gehabt und den würde ich gerne mit euch teilen. Wir sind eine Gesellschaft geworden, die vieles zu selbstverständlich nimmt. Ich glaube, dass es in den letzten Wochen, während dieser fürchterliche Krieg in Europa herrscht, auch noch einmal ganz, ganz deutlich geworden, dass wir Freiheit, dass wir Demokratie schätzen können und dass wir das Ganze mehr ehren und mehr verteidigen müssen. Ich glaube, das ist mittlerweile jedem klar geworden. Aber wir müssen auch den Boden, jawohl, vielen Dank. Ich glaube, das haben wir aber mittlerweile alle verstanden. Aber wer hat denn bitte wie oft darüber nachgedacht, dass wir den Boden schätzen? Dass wir das schätzen, auf dem wir laufen. 95 Prozent unserer Ernährung stammt aus unserem Boden. Und nicht nur das, was wir aus dem Boden essen, sondern was die Tiere genauso essen. Und dann geht ja der Kreislauf erst los. Für, erst los. 95 Prozent. Das heißt, wir müssen anfangen, und zwar jetzt, den Boden mehr zu schätzen. Deswegen der heutige Abend, deswegen die nächsten 100 Tage, deswegen diese Reise von Sadhguru. Und wir alle werden im Kleinen etwas dafür tun. Wir werden diese Botschaft weitertragen, indem wir es posten, indem wir bei Social Media davon erzählen, indem wir unseren Familien davon erzählen, unseren Freunden davon erzählen, die wiederum erzählen es weiter. Und wir alle tun vor allem auch eins. Wenn wir in die Natur gehen, wir machen uns mehr Gedanken darüber, den Boden, die Natur, das, was unser Lebenselixier ist, zu schätzen. Ich glaube, da können wir alle etwas tun und wir werden alle gemeinsam etwas tun. Dankeschön dafür. Sadhguru auf Weltreise. Beeindruckende Zahlen. Ich sage sie noch einmal, 30.000 Kilometer auf dem Motorrad. Das fahren andere in zehn Jahren oder noch länger mit dem Motorrad. Er macht es in 100 Tagen. Und von es ist wirklich um die halbe Welt mit einem großartigen, jetzt schon emotionalen Ziel, dann in knapp 96 Tagen in Indien. 
Aber diese Reise, und er hat es gerade selbst im Video und er wird es heute Abend auch wieder gesagt, hat eben diese Aufgabe, diese Botschaft um die Welt zu tragen. Wie sahen seine letzten 14 Tage aus? Das Ganze startete in der Karibik, ging dann über London vor zwei Tagen nach Amsterdam und jetzt hier nach Berlin. Auch hier haben wir Bilder für euch vorbereitet. Die Reise von Sadhguru bisher. Bitteschön. These uh, pearls uh, of uh, the ocean, which are the Caribbean nations, are going through this fast. Soil is not a separate subject. If we are interested in health, if we are interested in agriculture, if we are interested in the well-being of the citizens of today and the unborn child of tomorrow, attending to soil right now, attending to the soil biodiversity right now, this is a must do thing in our life. Soil. The only thing that we hated about you were your knowledge inside. <laughs> Always. <laughs> But our lives, we could help love you. We are at the cusp of time right now. If we act now, if we bring in the policies and start implementing this, in the next 12 to 15 years, we can make a significant turnaround. So this memorandum of understanding that we are signing, it will also bring some technical assistance. So this is something that you're very concerned about, and rightly so, that there's uh, a problem with the topsoil in America. Uh, 50% of the American farmers have not seen a dollar in the last 12 years. Tja, liebe Leute, so geht es dann auch manchmal. Also man muss sich das so vorstellen. Also erstmal vielen Dank für den Applaus, gerade für das Video, der einen äh, kleinen Teil nur gezeigt hat, dieser Reise. Eigentlich sollte das Video noch etwas länger gehen, aber ihr habt das gehört, es gab da das eine oder andere kleine technische Problem. Aber, und das glaube ich ist wichtig, wir alle haben einen Eindruck davon bekommen, was passiert, was diese Reise ausgemacht hat. In der Karibik gestartet, über London nach Amsterdam und jetzt hier nach Berlin.
Dann in zwei Tagen geht es weiter in Prag. Die ganze Technik reist mit. Insofern, da glaube ich, haben wir Verständnis. Das ist überhaupt kein Problem. Und wir sind ja alle vor allem auch wegen einer Geschichte heute Abend hier. Wir wollen ihn sehen, gemeinsam im Gespräch mit einer wunderbaren Frau. Zuerst zwei Worte zu ihr. Eines der ganz, ganz großen Topmodels. Sie hat für alle großen Marken dieser Welt gearbeitet. Aber das, was noch viel imposanter neben ihrer einzigartigen Karriere auf dem Laufsteg oder für die Fotos ist, das ist vor allem ihr soziales, ihr gesellschaftliches Engagement. Seit 2014 ist sie Botschafterin für Plan International. Sie hat dort eine große Kampagne begleitet. Da ging es um das Thema Rechte von Frauen, Rechte von Mädchen. Und dafür setzt sie sich auch mittlerweile mit der Toni Gahn Stiftung ganz persönlich, wirklich in einem großartigen Ausmaß ein. Ich freue mich sehr, dass sie zu uns kommt. Gemeinsam mit ihm, sein Motorrad steht in der Garage, er ist bereit für die Bühne. Und jetzt holen wir die beiden hier auf die Bühne. Herzlich willkommen, hier sind Toni Gahn und Sat Guru. Sadhguru! Kalo na janati tava jananam Kalo na janati tava samapanam drushto maya tava mahakara yogeshwara kala kala yogeshwara kala kala Good evening, everyone. Tony, you're the boss now. I'm the boss. Oh gosh, don't say that. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Sadhguru, welcome to Berlin. Thank you. It is a huge honor of mine to welcome you to Germany, welcome you to Berlin. It is such an honor. I can't believe I'm sitting here. I was asked to do this yesterday, so bear with me, everyone. Um, First of all, I'd like to say thank you for you to go on this incredible journey, spread this very, very, very important message of saving our soil. We all begin as soil, we all end as soil. It is one of the most important messages of our lifetime. I was aware of um, the issues around soil through some um, agriculture nerds, I would say, in New York that have always taught me monoculture is a bad thing, biodiversity farming is so, so important. What I was not aware of and what really struck me as crucial and so horrible is the um, deficiency of nutrients that we're eating in our food now. I have an eight-month-old at home that I'm trying to feed healthy food every day. My first question to you is, how is it possible to eat ourselves but feed the next generation vitamin-full, nutrient-full, healthy nutrition? Uh, that, uh, that's a tough job if you're living in the world, unless uh, if you're living in an urban center, it's uh, definitely a challenge because for that you have to live on a farm and grow your own food, which is definitely not practical. So we have come to that place where uh, the nutrient levels are coming down significantly and uh, various substitutes are being talked about. People are talking about... Uh, all kinds of other alternatives. One alternative is of course popping pills and uh, to what extent means, <laughs> I must tell you, I was driving in Los Angeles just last month and I see uh, a fifteen floor building that size hoarding, fifteen floor building size hoarding, full building sized hoarding, the only words on it is my favorite pharmacy. <laughs> I thought, when did pharmacies become a favorite place to go? Next thing is, I was looking for a board, my favorite hospital, my favorite cemetery somewhere. 
these are all places we go to and it's inevitable, all right? Nobody... See, when you say uh, a place is favorite, that means you want to visit that place. It's like a favorite restaurant, a favorite holiday place. Favorite pharmacy, favorite hospital, favorite cemetery, no. Because these are places you go only when you must go, not otherwise. But what they mean by this is that today, uh, particularly in United States, they become very conscious that there is not enough nutrient in the food that they are consuming. So everybody is popping dozens of pills, healthy people, I'm not talking about sick people. Very healthy people are popping dozens of pills because micronutrients are missing. Today there's enough study to show various chronic ailments that we are suffering, including the incidence of cancer and children suffering from ADD and various other ABCD, you know, all the twenty-six alphabets. Uh, largely or partially could, could be, be because, because of nutrient, nutrient deficiency. deficiency. There, there is substantial study to show that the amount of uh, psychological or mental illnesses that people are going through is also because of nutrient deficiency. Uh, there is very significant studies in this direction now. Today you know, all of you must know that uh, about a year ago or maybe six months ago, the WHO warned the world that we are heading towards a mental illness uh, pandemic. When we use the word pandemic, what it means is, that is, uh, if we sit in this hall, if one person has got something, we may all get it. We are all susceptible, that's a pandemic. So when we talk about mental Ill illness pandemic, they're talking about a suicide pandemic. It is some of the studies, hope this won't come true. They're saying by 2050, up to two to five percent of the human populations could be aspiring to commit suicide. Last year, in 2020, in Japan, more people committed suicide than the number of people who died of the coronavirus. So we don't really need the virus, I'm saying. So, all these things happening, one way or the other related to soil because who we are right now here is just a consequence of what's happening in the soil. Today everybody understands without the gut microbiome, you cannot digest the food that you eat, you have no assimilation of nutrients. And this is the same with the soil also. In the soil, the same is true. Without the help of the microbiomes or the microbial activity, without all those complex little life that is there, Plants cannot get its nutrients. So if... Uh, don't do this experiment, it's very cruel. But if you take a tree, don't damage the entire tree, just take off all the leaf from the tree. It will try to sprout back, take it off, take it off. A tree will die within twelve to eighteen months because only if the tree captures the carbon from the atmosphere, converts into carbon sugar and pumps it down into the soil, the microbes will give them food. Essentially, if the tree runs out of cash, this is the cash. Carbon sugar is the cash with which it buys its food. If you deprive it of its money, then it will die without nutrition. So, this green leaf is that important. If we have to go back to the history of this, because I see a lot of green shirts out here, <laughs> so, uh, this happened, maybe scientists say approximately a billion years ago. A very smart algae or a fungi, one of them, suddenly got a bright idea. Like you heard some cave man or woman, generally they say it's a man, okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, about who discovered the fire and learned how to cook their food with this fire. Maybe it was a woman, but uh, because she set fire to the man, they said a caveman was on fire. <laughs> so whichever way, uh, some fifteen, twenty thousand or hundred thousand years ago, somebody discovered fire and found out how we could cook our food with fire. Since then the world has not been the same, all right, for all of us. 
Similarly, this algae or fungi discovered how to cook its food with solar energy, which is a perpetual energy from the sun. So this phenomena of cooking their food is called photosynthesis. And this is the most phenomenal thing that is happening on the planet. We are all alive only because of that. Because before photosynthesis started, the oxygen content in our atmosphere was just a shade over one percent. Today it is twenty-one percent, that's why we are all alive. And all the complex life forms are capable of being alive on this planet only because of the oxygen content in the atmosphere. But if you look back and see, thousand years ago, how much photosynthesis was happening on this planet? And today, how much photosynthesis is happening? Take a guess, how much drop could have happened? Guess, just guess. A couple hundred percent, maybe. Couple of hundred percent. Unfortunately, <laughs> maybe not that much, I don't know. Let's say uh, a little uh, thirty percent. Eighty-five percent drop. Okay, that's horrible enough. Eighty-five yeah. percent drop in photosynthesis has happened. Never before planet has been this bare. All agricultural lands are bare, urban lands are paved. They are plowed, these are paved. This is the main problem. So, Everywhere, all these, uh, you know, online uh, scientists or let me call them WhatsApp scientists, they read uh, two messages and they become scientists. All these people, if you say carbon, they say, oh, poison. Carbon is not poison. We are all carbon life. Hello? We are made of carbon. Every life that you know here, worm, insect, bird, animal, tree, everything is made of carbon. What we call as life itself is a carbon chain or a carbon cycle. In this carbon cycle, the important part of exchange or continuity of this cycle is photosynthesis and more important part is the soil. If it doesn't go into the soil constantly, we are breaking the carbon chain. If the carbon chain breaks, this means in some way we are dismantling the fundamental life infrastructure. That is what is happening right now. Today we are calling this soil extinction. You heard of dinosaurs going extinct, dodos going extinct. No, we are talking about soil extinction. Soil extinction means the basic infrastructure for life is being dismantled. Horrible. Absolutely horrible. Um, my second question to you was a different, completely different one. I have a foundation for girls' education in four different African countries. We work in Eastern Africa, in Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and in the West, in Ghana. Um, we enable girls and young women to be able to access education and healthcare. Um, as you can imagine, we're always in the rural areas, by the way. As you can imagine, agriculture plays a huge part. When we ask the girls how many of your parents is farmers, they all raise their hand. When I ask them how many of you would like to become farmers, they all take their hands down. They would all like to become lawyers, doctors, which is incredible. But my question to you is how can we make it no, more it's not appealing? Very incredible because uh, if uh, you're a lawyer and I'm a doctor, for you, somebody should be in trouble. For me, somebody should be sick. That's true, you would think being a farmer Farmers farmer is... means incredible, that means somebody is eating good food. Exactly, and you get to be outside. This is what I'm trying to get at. Basically, my question is how can we make it more appealing because these young girls yes. have only seen their poor parents that have not been able to provide properly or create a business out of this incredible soil that I thought Africa has very um, nutrient-full mm -hmm. soil but yet they live from the hand to their mouth and they don't want to become farmers, but we need them to become farmers, correct? See, this problem is not just in Africa, it's across the board, everywhere in the world. For example, in India, over sixty percent of Indian population are farmers right now. But we have not asked the children because we may get… we may draw zero. So we have asked the farmers, how many of you want your children to be farmers, not even two percent. So, this… this magic of converting mud into food is not a small thing. If there are highly educated people here, 
if you're an MBA or even if you're an MSc in agriculture, I will give you ten acres of land and ask you to grow five different varieties of crops for me. Please don't torture the child, huh? <laughs> So, uh, if you ask them to grow five different varieties of crops, believe me, highly educated people cannot do that because we're taking agriculture for granted because people are functioning out of intrinsic knowledge which they have gathered from hundreds of generations. So if this generation goes away in another twenty years or twenty-five years, who is going to perform this magic of mud to food? Once you lose that capability or that knowledge of doing this, well, the world will pay a very severe price and this is not in one place in Africa, this is across the world, across the world. Why is this so? Why this is so is, See, for example, in United States, I'm taking United States as an example because one thing is it's a most affluent nation, another thing is a whole lot of things are better documented there than anywhere else. Fifty percent of the American farmers have not earned a single dollar of profit in the last twelve years, fifty percent. And the highest suicide rates among any professions in America is among the farmers, whole families shooting themselves. Because for years on end, if you don't make a dollar, how do you survive? Loans will grow, input costs will grow, then you have no way to survive. The only way is to lose the land. So this is happening in India also, I'm sure it's happening everywhere else. In India in the last twenty years, three hundred thousand farmers have committed suicide. Everybody says, oh, it's because of the bank loan, it's because happened because of this, because of that. I'm asking you, any one of you or all of you, if you were a farmer, you were on the land, whatever loans you have, whatever troubles you have, if not for commercial purpose, even if you could grow food for your own family, would you kill yourself? Hello? Definitely not, isn't it? With Africa, the problem is migration. In the… by 2032, it is expected there will be a migration of 1.2 billion people from across the world to urban centers. In India alone, 220 million people will migrate. Why are people migrating? If there was food on the land, why would they go somewhere? When people migrate in unplanned ways, because the countries that you mentioned, this is a massive problem, in southern Europe, where when people drag their wives and children and try to go to another land where they don't know the language, they don't know how to live, how to survive, nothing, simply they're coming. What happens to children and women in this whole journey is most horrendous. And how they get exploited when they come to this new place is unspeakable. Terrible things are happening. Everybody keeps their mouth shut because these people have no identities, they have no ID card, nobody knows who they are, whether they live or die, there is no account of any kind. So this is happening, if you want to prevent this, if we want to stem migration, people who consciously migrate to some other place, it's their choice. But people who are forced to migrate because there is no food to eat in the place they are, that's not a fair thing, food must always grow where people are, it's very, very important, not somewhere else. <laughs> so this migration itself can be a massive disaster in the next eight to ten years. One point two billion people moving. We will only… the media will only report the number of deaths on the way. Nobody can report the suffering that people go through, the humiliations that they go through, the debasement that happens to women and children. These things can never be recorded by anybody. Only deaths will be counted, that also we don't know. Yeah. So, what can we do? <laughs> no, no, this is not to draw a doomsday picture. Why we are doing this journey, why this movement is... Because we are a unique generation, we are in a place, we are in a cusp of time right now. If we act now with the right kind of policies, why I'm insisting on policies, 
See, let's say you own some land, I own some land, you take really good care of your land, I do the same. But what is the guarantee the next generation won't mess it up, as we have already? So only if it's instituted in the policy, it is ensured that forever, sustainably, the land will stay that way. For example, in every city there will be a old part of the city, I do not know much about Berlin, but I'm sure you will know. There will be old part of the city where homes are built in such a way, wall to wall they're built. Do you have such a segment of Berlin somewhere? I'm new here as well, I believe we do, yeah. <laughs> so there will be one place everywhere in every city, old cities, where there's no concept of a window in the house. There's only one door to go in and come out. In every city there will be some part like this. Why did this happen? Because there were no laws. But today if you have ten thousand square feet of land in Berlin city, you can't build ten thousand square feet. You can only build six or seven thousand square feet, whatever is the law. Some space you have to allow for yourself, your neighbor and all this stuff. If you build more, they will come and demolish it. But if you have hundred acres of agricultural land, you can plow every inch of it. And in ten years' time, you turn it into a desert. Nobody will ask you, why have you done this? Soil is not our property. Soil is a legacy we have received from the past. We must pass it on in its living condition to the future generations. Right now, the soil or the food that we are consuming all... all everybody, every one of us should be conscious of this. The food that we are consuming is actually not even belonging to the next generation that is already here. It belongs to the unborn child. Eating up the food allotted for the unborn child, in my emotion, feels like a crime against humanity to me. An unborn child who has no... no way to defend himself or herself, you already eat up their food, when they come there is no food here. This is a real crime against humanity. But that's exactly what we're doing, simply because everybody, you know, like uh, last two years I've been traveling, twenty-five years we've been doing this work. Last two years particularly I've been traveling and meeting various people, government officials, ministers, variety of people and scientists. Any what success? I see is... Huh? Change? Any success there? Are they open for that Yes, kind of what I see is everybody knows what's the problem. And everybody knows what's the solution. Everybody says, Sadhguru, yes, it must be done. Then I realized everybody knows the problem, everybody generally knows the solution. They were just waiting for an idiot to bell the cat. Here I am so important. It is um, the most important um, message of our time, I believe, and it's so great that you're doing this on a motorbike. I really hope you r love riding a motorbike, by the way, because this journey sounds <laughs> absolutely incredible. I asked your team how many are riding with you. They said, nobody. It's always you by yourself on a bike. Yeah. Wow. Well... It's... <laughs> <laughs> Um, I believe I was told... This, is, uh, this part of keeping social distance, you know. Of course, if you this, ride is, this is no, what no, we do. No, no, not this. Motorcycle, if you ride fast, nobody's around you. Of course, it's so smart. <laughs> and you get... You could go as fast as you like. You don't need to pay attention to any slow drivers. You get to get there and speed it all up. Um, speaking of which, I was told I have to keep some time to leave questions from the audience. I don't know if this is the right time to do this, but if any of you have any questions, um, you can start raising your hand and we can um, take questions from whoever would like. Okay, I'll start with this guy straight ahead. You're being pushed back. Oh, he's getting a mic, okay. Namaskaram Sadhguru. Oh, sorry. Please, if you could mention your name and where you're from. My name is Vikram. I'm from India. Going down to Sadhguru's feet. Uh, why are you copying a question? <laughs> Actually, I've prepared and I don't want to forget uh, any line asking in my question, Sadhguru. I'm sorry for this. <laughs> so, 
My question is not directly on soil, but definitely includes safe soil. Please allow me to speak for a couple of minutes. No, 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 just question, please. Before question. I ask the question, I no, will no, speed no, up. Just, just question, please. There's so many people, all right? Okay. So, so Sadhguru, a yogi, Oh, no, no, that everybody knows and, he's a yogi. And visionary Come whose on. only business in the world is human well-being. So, Sadhguru at sixty-five years of age… Hey, come to the question. A lone motorcyclist… Don't, don't disclose my age to everybody, come on. <laughs> risking his life, bike riding hundred days, thirty thousand kilometers across twenty-four countries in European cold, Arabian heat and Indian rainy weather conditions for saving soil for the sake of present and future life on the Mother Earth. So my question, how do you make it happen or what does it take for a human being to become Sadhguru or let's say the entire humanity on the planet to become Sadhgurus? See, uh, we are in a democratic uh, setup in the world, largely. Most nations are democratically ruled. What this means is uh, that actually in Tamil language, it is appropriately described, the word democracy in Tamil means jananaikam. That means people's rule or rule, people are the rulers, that's what it means, that's what it is. So the most important thing about democracy is whether you are a king or a pauper, whether you have a full brain or a half brain, you are a guru or no guru, you are a man or a woman, whatever you are, you just got only one vote. Hello? One person, only one vote. So at least on one level, everybody is leveled out. After that they can climb, somebody's you know, upper region, somebody in the lower regions. That happens in a society, you can't help and it's okay. But every five years, everybody is leveled down because everybody has only one vote and you also have one vote. Vote, you leave, I will leave it to you, how you… what your discretion is about how you use your vote, I will leave that to you. I don't want to get political. But your voice, your voice is as important as your vote. Your voice is also a mandate for the government. Till now, in any country, just in any country, have people express at least sixty percent of the voting population, have they expressed that we are concerned about the long-term issues of this nation? No, they're just asking, we want one percent discount in tax, we want this benefit, that benefit, and that's what they're getting. The whole administration and policy making is always about taxes, petrol price, this price, that price. This is all the entire world's economy is discussing about. Once in a way in this UN related, uh, uh, what do you say, agencies having these conferences, there they're talking about how to fix the world. But everybody has learned to attend conferences and go back home. Conference attending itself has become one kind of profession these days. You know, really, I used to <laughs> at one time, uh, uh, I was attending a lot of these world peace conferences, there are lots of them happening. One world peace conference I went to, I don't want to mention the place or the name because <laughs> there are too many prominent people there. There were forty-two Nobel laureates in the conference, peace confer conference. Then uh, I'm like this, uh, I will go and sit in the front row because I want to listen to every word. I'm not going there for entertainment. So this was going on on the second or third day, afternoon at two o'clock, one Nobel laureate comes on stage and goes behind this thing and he's come with a bunch of pages, he opened it up and at two o'clock in the afternoon he started reading, reading, reading. I was just counting the pages, forty-two pages he read, without looking up even once. He just read forty-two pages. 
I looked around, the hall was really peaceful. <laughs> Literally everybody except the security and staff who were standing and myself, everybody were dozing. <laughs> then my chance to speak is just after this man. So, I opened up my bullhorn kind of voice and did a chant, then they all woke up <laughs> Then I said, uh, see, we're talking about world peace. How many of you can genuinely put your hand on your heart and say that your mind is peaceful? If you can't make your mind peaceful, world peace is a joke. Hello? What is happening in the world? <laughs> what, what is happening in the world is just an enlarged manifestation of what's happening in human minds. If human minds were really peaceful, why would the world not be peaceful? They were sincere enough to admit, no Sadhguru, we, were not, we are not peaceful. Then first, is it not the thing to address? Because the world is very peaceful if human beings were not here. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> very, very peaceful. And if you're really serious, this is what you should do. And I stopped going to these world peace conferences. I don't know if they're still happening. They must be happening somewhere. Then I realized, then I asked why in the afternoon everybody was, like without exception, everybody was asleep. They said, no Sadhguru, yesterday evening there was a Bacardi festival. <laughs> oh. Festival, free drinks were there. So everybody drank and today afternoon they are dozing off in the conference, all right? <laughs> so world can become peaceful if everybody gets drunk. <laughs> world can be become peaceful if everybody is drugged out. World can also become peaceful if all of us are just dead. But that is... That is not the way to become peaceful, to be dynamically active, to be involved and still be peaceful. For this, individual people have to become peaceful, just like that. Now coming to the soil, see the problem with the world is this, when people have to get something, they're all special people, oh, why I didn't get my share, or my, my rights and everything. When they have to contribute something, they become so small. I'm just a small guy, you know. I must, <laughs> I must tell you this, this happened long time ago in eighteenth century, this happened. People believed there are other people on the moon. And they decided they want to talk to them. Let's say it's Berlin. They decided we must talk to them, who is there on the moon? How to communicate? They said, if all of us come on our rooftops and really shout in one voice, they will hear and let's see what they say. Because moon is just here, right? This happened, a joke inside a joke, okay? Are you all right? Are you all right? Shankar and Pillai went for a job in… <laughs> Even you? Even you know Shankaran Pillai? <laughs> Shankaran Pillai, you don't know him, I'm introducing <laughs> He's a… he's a… he's a South Indian man, okay? <laughs> Not a person, he's a man <laughs> So he went for a job interview in Bangalore. So the interviewer was uh, looking at various things and then he asked one question. Which is closer, moon or Mumbai? Shankaran Pillai said, moon. He said, how do you say that? How is moon closer than Mumbai? He said, I can see the moon, I can't see Mumbai <laughs> So they decided in one voice to shout, who are you? But who are you, you know, like let us make it happen, it gets get mixed up. So in one word, we will all say who at a given moment. So that time was set, everybody got on top of the Berlin rooftops, everybody ready. That moment coming, you know me, I thought, 
what is me? I'm just a small guy. Even with the microphone, people are not able to hear. If I don't say who, what does it happen? So many big people are here, they will all say it. That moment came and it passed in total silence. <laughs> this is what is happening in the world, you know? Like uh, Lord William Moria was saying, I was there for one and a half weeks in COP26. I addressed thirty different events, I spoke to everybody that was there, but I did not hear the word soil. I spoke to a few of the environment ministers from various countries, they all said, Sadhguru, we never heard the word soil. Why? When forty percent of global warming and climate change is happening because of ploughed soils on the planet, why is it that we are so silent? Young people should research and find out why. You must find out why, it's very important. And you, Vikram, from India, okay? With the people clapping for that <laughs> So, uh, you must understand, there's many people here in this hall, maybe twelve hundred people, I guess, am I correct? Around that much, I think. If all of you, all of you have a phone, that silly, f that silly phone you have? Oh, I'm sorry, smartphone. <laughs> See, you call something smart or you call someone smart only if they're smarter than you, isn't it? Hello? So, this phone is not for you to send silly messages to each other. This is a powerhouse, all right? If you use it right, you can reach the entire world. These twelve hundred people, if they're committed for a few minutes for the next hundred days, these twelve hundred just in Berlin alone can reach three to four billion people. What do you think? Yeah. But, 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 you know, London people are doing, Delhi people are doing, oh, even in Dubai, ten thousand people will gather. What is it? We are just twelve hundred people. Let us go home and uh... suck our thumb or drink Bacardi. Then it what won't work. That? This is the only reason why it's not happened because human beings have not expressed their responsibility. They're acting like because we always they think someone else here. will do it. Someone hmm? else will do it. He'll do it. She'll do it. Children. We always think someone else will do it. I really like hmm? that moon story. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's all get on it and let's all create change and let's all do it. Um, what I really want to know, what I want to know is what did you say after that um, peace talk when you got up there? What was your peace talk? What were you saying? Do you remember? Mm. What did I say after on the... After the Nobel Peace guy spoke mm -hmm. with the 42 pages, do you this remember what, what I you said? This is what I asked them. Have any one of you genuinely, can you say, your mind is peaceful? They admitted, no, we are not peaceful because we are worried about the world peace. <laughs> and hungover. <laughs> if you're not peaceful, how will you ever make world peaceful? See, if my hands are dirty, the more I touch you, the more you will also become dirty. The best thing is to stay away, isn't it? So if these hands are dirty, first thing is to clean these hands, isn't it? So if this is not first. peaceful, first thing is to make this one peaceful. No, I want to make you peaceful. <laughs> this is the problem <laughs> Okay, more questions. Who else would like to ask a question? How am I supposed to pick? Would you like to pick, Sadhguru? Hmm? Would you like to pick? I would love if you pick. Really? You're the boss. Uh, I'll have the lady here in the second row. Hey, whoever does the lelele -le -le jig, they will get it. Exactly. <laughs> and name and where you're from, please, first. I already picked someone, sorry. <laughs> what do you think? We should get Tony to do the jig, isn't it? <laughs> Namaskaram Sadhguru. Uh, my name is Manali Shetty from India. Oh. <laughs> I have a... I have a story about why Indians ask so many questions <laughs> Okay, uh, 
uh, my question is uh, i do not belong to a farmer's family and i have grown up in a modern city with no proper awareness about soil saving so do you think this saving soil awareness should be introduced in the early age of uh, students life in education system uh, i would have done that but we can't roll back time so we have chosen to do it right now with you <laughs> see this is another thing that's going on particularly in europe also in united states beginning to infect india this is everybody says, let's go to the schools and activate the children they must know all these companies which are destroying the world please children below 15 years of age do not put negative emotions into them about anything or anybody because how how a child processes negative emotion is very different from how a mature adult would do i i'm not saying all of you are mature i'm saying <laughs> once you put this anger oh she is the one who is destroying this planet because she is this company or this country or something i'm telling you a child will suffer for the rest of his or her life with those emotions so do not activate the children why are you going on saying children must be taught children you yourself have not gotten it why the children should get it before you if you set an example children will do it anyway if you set a wrong example children will do the wrong things if you set a right example they will do the right things you are setting a wrong example and trying to preach them then they will do utterly wrong things don't give preachings set an example that you are a conscious human being who does not cause damage around yourself whether to your life or to anybody else's life you're not causing damage if you set up this example children will be fine you don't have to educate them they learn by observing you they never listen to your preaching and i'm glad they don't <laughs> so simple but so so wise and so deep everyone let's just be good examples and then the rest can follow second third question <laughs> okay you're singing very loud over there i'll take you mr pink shirt <laughs> Hello Sadhguru. Oh, another Indian. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> My name is Igor. I am from Hamburg from Germany. <laughs> And uh, my question is, we saw at the video that you met some people from the government in the countries where you have been. What are your plans for Germany? could you meet some people from the german government and submit any kind of submit any kind of documents or what are your plans for germany and the second question is it's a great idea no, to we'll handle this one question okay so, okay this is troublesome enough okay sorry <laughs> so uh see uh, we had planned our route in a certain way that we would have come to northern part of europe that's let's say berlin in mid april according to our initial plan but we changed our route because we were told that this is the time that your parliament what bundes what what do you call it bundestag bundes bundestag okay that one <laughs> I'm not getting that. Anyway, the parliament is meeting only for these four days. So we rejigged the whole route and took the risk of uh, coming to Northern Europe and riding through this part of the country or this part of uh, the continent in March. Because generally March could be very cold. As we go further east, it could be icy, the roads could be icy. icy roads and uh, motorcycles are not friendly you know 
they don't like each other <laughs> so because of that we had planned differently because of the parliament meeting we did this but now wherever you go there is almost like an agreement don't handle anything except the war it looks like this kind of instructions are even gone to the major media nothing but the war must be reported okay so everywhere it's war this week the german parliament was i mean not the german parliament i'm sorry the european union was supposed to announce regenerative agricultural policy so in expectation of that we decided to come at this time but now they are saying it is postponed by 2 years because of the war where do you get in the last 50 years where had where has there been a 2 year period there were, when there was no war human beings have been constantly fighting with somebody somewhere somebody is always waging a war so if you postpone it by 2 years something that is so vital which you are about to address and now postpone it it's a uh, very disappointing and now they're saying nobody is available because this is happening tomorrow we're making an attempt to meet a few lawmakers but we don't know yet because uh, today we were supposed to meet some in the afternoon but uh, they were all asked to stay in the parliament because there's some budget session going on i understand government business is there they have to do that but it's become very difficult to meet any lawmaker because generally everybody is saying it's war but what are we doing for war here war is an unfortunate situation we don't have to make it a global phenomena unfortunately every few years there's a war somewhere all right not like the soil issue makes war any better aren't lots of wars fought, fought as well over soil yes. and over land wars are fought on the land and what damage they cause is another story we cannot even talk about it but i feel if the people of germany and not only germany people of europe because it's a european union policy if you at least ask them to prepone maybe po- because of the war if you're stuck on so many things maybe 6 months postponement okay 2 years is too bad even more so for all of us to speak up actually i had another question i'm sorry i'm going to jump in quickly what we as individuals we know what we can do we can spread the word we can post we can use our powerhouse smartphones us as a society specifically here in berlin and germany is there something where you say you guys need to be doing this more or start this see ya uh, the isha home school in india the children there took up this challenge they are they have promised me and they are doing very well right now they are getting 10 million children across india to write a letter to the prime minister <laughs> now 10 million children if they write letters to the prime minister you think he's going to ignore that he will not ignore that and he cannot ignore that because when we did rally for rivers in 29 days of me driving from southern tip of india to himalayas in 29 days i gathered the support of 162 million people because of this what the policy the policy document that we produced as to how to manage indian rivers a 760 page document when we gave it to the prime minister and then it went into the planning commission and it went through the whole process within three and a half months this became the official policy for 28 states in india today uh, you know as a part of as a part of rally for rivers we started manifesting this plan that we made in the policy in one river basin called kaveri it's called the project is called kaveri calling so here it is 83000 square kilometers of land 5.2 million farmers live and work in this river basin because of the success of this project four un agencies are partners with us today and the government the central government seeing the success of this project on the basis of this project replicating this project they made detailed project reports for 13 river basins 
And just now, four days ago, they announced a budget of 2.5 billion dollars as a budget for these thirteen river basins. This is the way policy moves. Well, it's taken... Uh, it took us seven to eight years to change certain policies which are restrictive, to remove those rules so that farmers could actually plant trees on their land. And now it took another five years before they would allocate a budget. But this is how the government and the machinery of the government moves. But this is a sure thing. Because once the government policy, it, once it is enshrined in the government policy, budget will come, government machinery will start moving in that direction, only then something real will happen. Otherwise, when I say fix the soil, save the soil, you go home and start fixing your garden. Well, that's very cute, but it's not a solution. It is not a solution. You fix your land, I fix my land, wonderful, but this is not a solution because seventy-one percent of the world's land is agriculture. If you don't change that, this will not change. And when it comes to soil and ecology, national boundaries are meaningless, okay? When it comes to life, life per se, national boundaries mean nothing. These are lines that we have drawn in our own heads. has a question <laughs> So, so about that question, one second. You can all write to your local member of the parliament or all of you can write to your chancellor or get children to write to the chancellor, get... See, in India we need ten million letters. Here, get a million letters to your chancellor, job will be done. Now we know what to do, let's all spread that message. Choose somebody from the upper world, no. you know. Uh, okay. <laughs> Where are you? Here. Everyone's waving. Oh, straight ahead. I don't know if you can see her. She's behind the cameraman. Mm -hmm. Hi. Yes. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm a little nervous. Uh, I am 20. I'm Lena and I'm from Germany. Hey, this is not a confession, okay? All right. <laughs> and I'm an addict. No. Um, I grew up on a farm. My grandparents are farmers. And I decided for myself that I want to take a different path and like moving to the city, studying. How can I have a healthy life with the nutrients I need, with, but with the like food I get here in the supermarket, but also not like buying avocados from like, I don't know, 10,000 miles away to get that? How is that possible? How can I keep that balance like in my personal life? Oh, I thought you wanted to go back to the farm. No. no. <laughs> So, this issue that you brought up and what I also said about India, about how many people in the next generation want to go into farming, the only way you can send them back to farming is to make it so lucrative that if not more, at least they earn as much as a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer, the farmer must earn as much. Only then next generation will go. Our twenty-year-old magic, she doesn't want to go back but she wants to eat the best food, but somebody should grow it. <laughs> nothing... <laughs> nothing wrong with that, you're a young woman, you can do what you want. But uh, how to get that food? Well, in a large city, I cannot say how because you can only buy it in a store. You growing your own food is not a practical solution. If you want, you can have an avocado tree, that's easy to grow. Okay, <laughs> but the uh, rest of the food you can't grow like that, it is too diverse. So one thing is, uh, you must write to all the MPs, what do you call them, MPs? In? Prime Minister? Hmm? No, ministers. No, no, not ministers, the local representatives, parliamentary representatives. Um, Members of the parliament? Bundestag's Abgeordnete, there we go. I grew up English speaking as well, so okay. I'm a little behind as well. <laughs> Bundes what? Bundestag's Abgeordnete. Okay, to all those guys. Abgeordnete. You... Minister, I said Minister. 
you write one letter to all of them, get all your friends to write for them. Above all, as I said, these twelve hundred people, you move three to four billion people, I will see it becomes part of the policy that there must be a minimum of that much organic content. If that much organic content is there, naturally the usage of fertilizer will come down. Nobody, no farmer, will, because fertilizer is expensive, he's not going to just take it and throw it. If the land has enough richness, he will use minimum amount of it. Yes, some amount of poison is there in the air that you breathe, in the water that you drink, food that you eat, it's fine, but you're able to manage it at a certain level. When it crosses that level, that is when it is becoming a serious issue. So how much should be there? Right now, European Union has come up with a stringent law. How much fertilizer residue or how much pesticide residue can be there in your vegetables and fruits, there is some kind of a law, which I think Europe has the best law compared to any other part of the world. So that is there to limit that, but still to get fresh food. Fresh food means this. See, in the yogic culture, people keep asking me, Sadhguru, how is it that you are so energetic? How many things are you doing in your life? How is it that you slow sleep, sleep so little? Well, people, <laughs> you know, it's like this, I was at the Denver airport, about twenty-five, thirty people came to see me off. It was not announced, but somehow they find out and they come to the airport. And they all brought flowers and they're singing and dancing and happy, laughing. So one of the airport officials asked, why are they all so happy? I said, they're happy that I'm leaving. <laughs> because I was here for four days, these four days they have not eaten properly, they have not slept properly, day in and day out there. Because I stay awake, they also stay awake. <laughs> Non-stop work has been going on, they're celebrating that I'm leaving. <laughs> so, <laughs> how is it? Thing is just this. See, if you live properly, only forty percent of your energies should come from the food that you eat. Remaining sixty percent, should come from air, water and sunlight. So don't just ask, when you're concerned about health and well-being, you're concerned about your health, you're also concerned about how much you can do and what you can do with your life. When this is your concern, this is very important because the more you depend on food, the more inertia you will have. Inertia means, ah, well, let us say you're sleeping eight hours a day, if you're sleeping eight hours a day, you're going to sleep away one-third of your life itself. Hello? Yes or no? In twenty-four hours, eight hours if you sleep, one-third of your life sleeping. Is sleeping a crime? No, no, it is not. But if you sleep through your life, you will be a disaster. Yes or no? Right now the soil is a disaster are heading towards a disaster mainly because people are sleeping thinking somebody else will do it. Your life, nobody else will do it. You do it. The way you do it is the way it works, this life. So, if you're sleeping eight hours, one reason is you're thinking only food will create health. No, only forty percent should be food. Then you will be agile and you will be lighter than the breeze. Yes, now activity and what you do in your life is never burdensome because what is needed you will do. See, if you're a little heavy, you want to get up, uh, can you do it <laughs> for me? <laughs> if you're light, boom, you'll get up. You look at a child, you, before you tell him he will run, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> before you tell them anything, they're already there <laughs> because they enjoy moving their body. They just love it just to run and hop and jump for no reason, simply because body is feeling like that, joyful. So to become like this, uh, you need to do certain things, not only about how you eat, yes it's important, how you breathe, how you drink water, not only what you eat but how you eat also you must bring. In this group I can't do all this but you must pay some attention about this. Above all, see, uh, Germany is a nation known for its engineering. For example, when would you say a machine is well engineered? When it does just what you want, all right? 
If your car behaves the way you want, you say, this is a great car. If you want to go like this, it goes like this. This is not a great car. <laughs> right now, just look at yourself. You say you want to be peaceful, it does something else. You say you want to be joyful, it does something else. You say you want to be loving, it does something else. Today is my birthday, I'm not going to fight with anybody, boom that day. <laughs> this is because not well engineered, you must do some inner engineering with this. If you do that, whatever kind of food comes to you, you can do wonders out of it. About food, one thing you must do is you must eat the food fresh. When I say fresh, this word fresh has been forgotten in the West. The Western societies, what is fresh is forgotten. I don't know how many of you still go in the morning to the bakery when the bread is just being baked and it's smelling wonderful, you buy that loaf and come and have breakfast. Is anybody still doing it? French are doing it a little bit. Actually with bread, yes. Huh? With bread, yes. Yes? In Germany? You, me, yes, but I'm a huge bread person. Okay. But generally, most people are buying bread which is a month old or two weeks old or whatever. Yes or no? And everything is old like this. Most of the meat that people are eating is weeks old. See, in yogic culture, if you cook anything, within ninety, min ninety s uh, minutes or one and a half hours, you must eat it. After that, we won't eat because it'll gather inertia, it's called tamas. Once tamas comes, body becomes lethargic. So right now, if you don't keep your mind well, if you don't keep your mind exuberant and joyful, then you enjoy lethargy. All you like is you want to sleep. Sleep is a way of dodging life, isn't it? Hello? Hello? Oh, you know, not bad. You think anyway somebody is going to say yes. Save soil. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> so, from now on, you just have to pay a little attention. There's a lot of material we've put out about food and inner engineering. Please look it up because how you keep this machine? This is the most sophisticated machine on the planet. Do you agree with me? Yes. This machine, have you read the user's manual? If you don't read the user's manual, you're operating it by accident. <laughs> Accidentally, sometimes you're happy, sometimes you're joyful, sometimes this. If somebody does something, boom, it'll plummet. This is very important. How you are or how you experience your life must be determined by you. What you do in the world, there are many forces what to do, according to them you have to do. But how you are within yourself must be determined by you and you alone, yes or no? Yes. This moment I am joyful or miserable must be determined by me, not by somebody else. If somebody else decides this, <laughs> then you eat all the best food, it'll all go waste. So it's very important you must understand the food that we eat, the way we breathe, the way we sit, the way we stand, all these things are a little bit of engineering. If you engineer this properly, then this will function just the way you want. In our lives, see what the world throws at us is not our choice. What we make out of it is hundred percent our choice. One more question. <laughs> okay, I can't not see the jacket. I'm gonna take the jacket, lady. And she sat back down. I, oh, it was for her friend. Oh, okay, yeah. Fine. Okay, fine. <laughs> uh, She's picking Naven, where for you're him. from as well. I think he needs a microphone. Hey, your, your I, partner, is a, she's a good campaigner, give her to me, yeah. for, give her to me for hundred days, huh? She, she makes yeah. a lot of noise. Yeah. She, ah. yeah. maybe, maybe if you ask chicken, come with you on the tour, you, you will be okay for that? 
Yes. All right. So, Sadhguru, my name is Mike. I'm originally from Ukraine, and I'm very happy to be here and to listen to you. Um, um, so, my question is the following. You've been talking a lot about policies. What do you think about technology? What can that do for a soil? Because it's not... If you go to Silicon Valley, for instance, right, all people say technology solves all of our problems. What do you think about that? What can technology do in this issue for us? See, with technology, because uh, if you want to solve any problem today, especially when if it's of a global scale, data becomes very important. Otherwise, we will be wasting our time and energy doing things which are not relevant to a given place. When data is very important, technology becomes very important. Even artificial intelligence becomes very important, I must tell you this. In southern India, this Kaveri Calling project, what we are doing, there's a growth-related subsidy attached to the trees. What the farmer has to do is, he has to just take a picture of his tree every year and put it on the website, the government website. Within ten to twelve hours, money goes straight to his bank account. This is a huge incentive for the farmer, that he doesn't have to go and stand in a line somewhere, he just have to take a picture and put it there. And there is also a digital marketplace that we have set up, where if the tree is four or five years of age, he can take a picture and auction it on the digital marketplace. I'm, I'm just... numbers I'm just throwing, these are not the real numbers. Let us say this tree is sold for ten thousand euros. Twelve years later, it is sold now. Twelve years later, growth related, the agreement is such, it is growth related, it is already sold for ten thousand euros. Year on year, second year if you send the picture, Looking at the picture, whoever is managing the market decides to give him five hundred euros this year, at once. Next year, maybe eight hundred euros. Like this, it goes. So let's say out of this ten thousand euros, up to seven thousand euros were already given, because the mark it's already sold. Last, when they come and cut the tree, they'll give you the remaining three thousand. This is a massive possibility for the farmer, because otherwise, he is not capable of waiting for twelve years. He doesn't have the f economic strength to wait for twelve years. So, technology is important this way. But at the same time, I would like to warn you because I planted myself in uh, California for twenty-five days uh, a couple of months ago because many people were to be met there. And uh, every second day somebody comes up to me and says, Sadhguru, my friend has created this fantastic app, it can solve all the problems. See, what is the food app in Berlin? Uh, food delivery? Yeah. Volt, Lieferando. What, what is that? Volt, W-O-L-T or Lieferando, Volt. I think are the two big ones. Okay, in India we have Swiggy, Piggy and these things like that, <laughs> all right? So you can call your alter Swiggy, Piggy, whatever you want, food comes to your house. But still somebody has to grow it, somebody has to cook it, delivery is happening by app. Cooking is not happening by the app, food growth is not happening by app, somebody still has to... there has to be a real world, In, we can enhance it by technology. Application can be enhanced, app simply means application. But today a whole lot of young people are beginning to think the app itself will do everything. Like they thought supermarket is producing all the stuff. No, you need to understand there is a world where things have to grow. So when it comes to soil, if you want to enhance organic content in the soil, which is the only issue we are talking about right now, to raise it to a minimum of three to six percent. But if you raise it to eight to ten percent, what would happen is, the irrigation requirement that you have for the land right now will come down to thirty percent of what it is right now. If you're using hundred liters, it'll become thirty liters. If you raise the organic content to twelve to fifteen percent, it will come down to ten to fifteen percent of what you're using right now. Right now over two billion people are water stressed in the world, 
by 2032, they're expecting 3.5 billion people will be water stressed. It means 3.5 billion people on this planet will have a hard time finding drinking water, okay? Maybe the shower and bath may go totally out of vogue. We may not afford it in future, so I'll enjoy it now, okay? <laughs> or you live near an ocean, you can jump in and swim at least. This is where we are going. For this, if you enhance organic content, soil's ability to store water is so greatly enhanced that irrigation requirement will come down. Why is this important? Because nearly seventy-four to seventy-six percent of the world's fresh water is used for agriculture. In India, eighty-four percent of our water is used for agriculture. That is where the issue is. If we reduce that usage, water stress will come down substantially for everybody. So technology is there and because you are from Ukraine, because your country is facing a certain situation right now, which unfortunately many countries across the world have faced in the last fifty years, how many wars? In Africa alone in the last fifty years, there have been thirty major wars. These thirty major wars, twenty-seven were fought to acquire fertile lands. And that will be the future war, to acquire fertile lands, to acquire water source. This will be the future wars and people will fight. At least we should take this step, now that you're facing a war close by, well, just the reverse is happening, but all of you as citizens can push it in this direction. This is not my work, because this is next generation should push this. See, we already have so many kinds of weaponry in the world. People are openly gloating about smart bombs. How can a bomb be smart? It's a goddamn dumb thing to do, to drop a bomb among all of you right now. Is it a smart thing to do? It's the dumbest thing to do, where people are there putting bombs. And how is a bomb smart? Why it is smart is, they are openly advertising like this in the military magazines. You can drop it through the window of a home, I believe, from the airplane, some two miles above the ground in the sky, from there they can drop the bomb into the house through the window. At least the cutting edge technology from now onwards, what's happened has happened, we can't help it. From now onwards, new technologies must not go into military use, at least make that much, no? Smarter and smarter ways to kill people. <laughs> Horrible. Horrible. One more question? Do we have time for one more question? Oh, I'm not sure if we have time. No, TSC, let me know if we have time for one more. No? No? Okay, you take over. <laughs> I'm so sorry for that, but thanks a lot. I know it's a very emotional moment, I think, for the most of us, Guru, thank you so much. I am deeply impressed and I think everybody of you is deeply impressed as well, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, first of all, we are not at the end. We are not at the, uh, not at the end because there's another chair coming on stage because we have another guest. But first, I have to say we have one task for tomorrow. Everybody of us has one task for tomorrow. We have to write a letter to the Bundeskanzleramt, where the Chancellor Olaf Scholz is working. The Bundeskanzleramt, the address is Willy Brandtstraße 1, 10557 Berlin. So everybody of us has to write a letter tomorrow in the morning. Okay. Maybe one, make a picture of this one, situation. One together. important thing is, whenever you mention anything ecological or environmental, always people are talking about whose face should be smashed now. Oh, this company is doing all the evil, that country is doing all the evil. We must drop this. All of us are partners in this destruction. Right. All of us can be partners in turning it around. <laughs> And we will follow it. 
So, let's make the stage free for our second guest. This is Professor Dr. Johan Röckström. He's the director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and professor at the Institute of Earth and Environmental Science at Potsdam University and professor in water systems and global sustainability at Stockholm University. One of the most famous professors in our world and we are very impressed to have him here to be with you on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big hand for Professor Johan Rockström. Welcome. Please have a seat. Well, it's an honor. Wonderful to be here with you. You hear me? Yes. And, um, well, I'm a scientist. I'm an Earth System scientist. But when I um, have been privileged to come into contact with the Save Our Soul campaign, Save Our Soil, Soul campaign, I just wanted to um, take this opportunity to share with you some of the latest scientific assessment of why I would even... Is it so that it's... Take mine. Take mine. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, exactly. There we are. There we are. <laughs> Why do scientific support to potentially even consider changing the logo that it's not only about saving our soil, it is that the soil saves us. And that that is what the scientific evidence is, is increasingly showing. So we are in the midst of a climate crisis. We have an ecological crisis. We have a health crisis and we have a war crisis and they're all interacting and the latest science shows that our only chance for a safe landing on the climate crisis is not only to phase out coal, oil and natural gas, we also need to secure the health of the soils and that this is now a precondition for our chance of having a livable future on earth for all future generations. It's come to that point. In the latest IPCC assessment, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that came out just a few months back, the numbers are clear. 56% of our emissions of greenhouse gases are taken up by nature. Half on land, in soils, and the other half in ocean. What is this? Well, this is a proof that our planet is a biogeochemical resilient machinery that is helping us humans for our future. It's basically providing us with the biggest subsidy to our lives. And what is it that takes up those 25% on land? Well, it's the soil. It is the ability, just as Saguru pointed out, of healthy soils having organic matter, soil moisture, rooting systems, that provides life on Earth, the photosynthesis that makes all our species on Earth, including Homo sapiens, having any chance of a future. And it's now providing, since 150 years, this phenomenal capacity of just adding more buffering. It is, it is dampening the enormous uh, debt that we've caused and threat that we've caused on planet Earth. How are we doing then to take care of nature, to continue having this service? Well, we're doing really bad. We're doing so bad, so the latest science shows that the richest terrestrial ecosystem on Earth, the Amazon rainforest, has just tipped over from being a carbon sink, taking up carbon in the soils, to now being a carbon source. This is nothing but a nightmare finding. We have more and more scientific evidence that we now need to halt all forms of expansion of agriculture because soil that we now manage to produce food for infrastructure for cities is a major emitter of greenhouse gases. In fact, it's the single largest emitter of greenhouse gases. So the only reason that soil is helping us is the intact nature. So we are doing really bad job on the soil that we're managing to produce food primarily, but also for grazing lands. And we have our last chance is really to safeguard intact nature, but also, of course, doing what, what you, Sadhguru, is such a strong ambassador for, to become clever stewards of the soil that we manage, 
to have good food for humans, but also to invest in management practices that builds carbon, that builds more moisture in the soils, that gives us more healthy food production. And the good news is we know how to do it. It's just amazing that we're not investing in the biggest opportunity we have, namely to restore health of soils. So the soil is today on a pathway towards undermining livability on Earth, but it's also potentially the biggest opportunity we have to shift the dial and move in the right direction. So I really applaud you in this not only saving soil, but the Soil Save Us campaign. Professor, if you want to ask, take any questions from people. We'll just continue with questions. Uh, I'll take the dancing lady back there. Somehow I always see the ones with the big movements. Can we get a microphone to her with the sign? <laughs> Look at her, she's doing such a good job. You can't ignore her. <laughs> oh. Test, test? Oh, okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Susan. Uh, my confession is I'm from Germany and also India. <laughs> so my question is, if we together can have a global rule or implement a global rule, what does it contain? What would you put into that global law or rule? Uh, let, uh, let the professor answer it from the scientific perspective, but what I would say is, because different pieces of geography are held by different nations, a global law is not going to work. A global, global recommendation is possible, but a law is not possible because law-making prerogative is not with any global body as such. It is individual nations, maybe with EU, uh, it is a region which can form those laws. In Commonwealth, we are trying to form laws through Commonwealth nations, which are fifty-four in number. But global law is not there, global consensus towards the right kind of laws can be made. Right now we prepared the soil document based on latitudinal position, economic conditions, agricultural traditions and soil types which are present there. These aspects are very important to make any law. You can't just make one prescription for everybody because it may not be implementable in many parts of the world either because of economic conditions or agricultural traditions being in a certain way, or soil types, many different kind of treatment. So, uh, there is no global law. Global consensus we can arrive at. Minimum three to six percent organic content should be there. How these individual nations should work out according to their realities, this is my opinion. Please, sir. Well, we're talking soils here tonight, to just uh, to give you one, one, one support to Sadhguru's principle, all soil in the world should have at least 3% organic carbon. That is what gives life, it gives carbon sequestration, it gives moisture, it gives good food production. An average African soil has 0.3%. It's been degraded to a point which explains why we have on average one ton per hectare on food crops on millet, sorghum, maize across most parts of sub-Saharan Africa. Can you imagine if you would go from 0.3 to 3%? In Africa, you would help the climate, you would help African development, you would secure food health, you would get rid of malnutrition, and you would move towards a positive development. Ukraine has the world's richest soil. The famous black cotton soils in Ukraine, the breadbasket of large parts of the world. 85% of the uh, 
grain imported to Egypt at the moment of the Arab Spring came from Ukraine and Russia. You may know that when the people took to the streets in Ukraine to the Arab Spring, the slogan was bread, freedom, dignity. Bread, freedom, dignity. Because the food prices had gone skyrocketing. Why? Because of forest fires that put a ban on exports on grain from Russia and Ukraine and droughts in Australia, attributed to climate change caused by us humans. Soil and food causing and triggering instability, which gave the rise to the Arab Spring. Soils is the core of that principle. So I would say that is really one of the key principles. But the second one, dear friends, is that we're actually at risk of destabilizing the whole planet. And what is it that regulates the, the, the health of the planet? Well, it is the planetary boundaries. The planetary boundaries is not only climate, it's the soils, it's biodiversity, it's fresh water, it's nitrogen, it's phosphorus, it's air pollutants, and it's chemicals. We need to keep all these within safe boundaries. We call that the safe operating space for humanity. Science now provides safe quantities for all of these boundaries. So I redefine sustainable development and, and human dignity in the following way. Prosperity and equity within planetary boundaries. That is, to me, the rule for humanity in the future. Okay, last question. Um, now everyone got a poster and is dancing. Very smart, you guys. Um, okay, I'll go with the very tall standing lady over there. Yeah, you. Just stay standing so they find you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Veronica. I come from, uh, born in Russia, lived in Slovenia. Um, my question to you was, we here now talk about the um, government and the population, I mean the, the um, um, civilians, but businesses play also a huge, huge role um, in this circle. And my question would be, what is right now the agenda of circular economy and the future of how businesses impact the, the change itself, including soil, of course? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th thanks for that re really important question. And I can start, and then I'm sure Sagura has very important reflections here as well. I would like to say that on, in general, in general, unfortunately, <clears throat> businesses have not understood to be stewards of soils, unfortunately. They've come a long way on climate, and climate is translated to carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is translated only to oil, coal, and natural gas. And, and we, should, we should actually, um, uh, in, in a way, almost celebrate that, that companies, businesses have come a long way to understand that circular economic business models to phase out fossil fuels is really, really happening. And Germany is actually a country that is really committed to land a, a net zero German welfare economy by 2045. And, and I, I applaud Germany for that. And I think Germany will succeed. But the problem is that we haven't recognized that it's equally important to do the same thing on soils. And we need to have that part integrated into all business as well. And you have a little handful of companies doing it, and I won't list them here, but there are a few important food companies that are starting to recognize that they need to have circular economic models, both for fresh water, for soil, and for biodiversity. But they are so few. This is why your leadership, Sadhguru, and this campaign is so important. Because again, the only safe landing we have is to get the soils on board. Say, uh, I would like to treat uh, businesses, because businesses have become, many businesses have become almost as large as nations. They're like small nations by themselves. Corporates have become that large. So, a business institution or a company 
is also like an individual. They can make a difference, their footprint is way bigger than an individual person, but still how much a person is willing to do consciously? If every one of us consciously dealt with this, it would have been a different affair, but that's not happened. So now expecting businesses to turn around by themselves is not the way. I feel policy is very important because a business which works within the policy framework, we must let them be, whatever they're doing. Otherwise, if you are a law-abiding citizen, nobody should mess with you in this country, that's how it should be. No, you're a law-abiding citizen, but I don't like what you're doing. This should not come up, this will lead to anarchy, you know. You're going by the law, within the framework of the law, you're doing whatever you want to do, but I don't like it. So I will try to enforce things on you, this is not a good society, this will lead to chaos. So the same goes for businesses. People are always telling me, Sadhguru, you are supporting fertilizer company. I say, see, is it legal? If it's legal, I won't touch it. If it's illegal, if they're doing something beyond the law of the nation, then we will talk about it. If they're within the framework of the law, we must talk to the lawmakers if the law itself is wrong, to change the framework of the law, rather than people who are playing within that field, accusing them of something and expecting them to be sages and saints. No, businesses are there to make profit. They must make profit because all the investors, investors are demanding profit. Will you invest in a company? You can give as much advice as you want. Will you invest in a company which does great things but doesn't make profit? No, isn't it? So leave it at that, business is a business house, it is supposed to make profit, but within the framework of law. If the framework of law is loose and allowing the business to cause damage, then you must address the law, not the business. <clears throat> so uh, as a... but at the same time, I've been talking to business leaders for last uh, twenty-five years, uh, non-stop in various conferences across the world. What I see is there is a phenomenal shift in the way business leaders are thinking. I've personally, you know, worked with a few of them and they have quietly changed their businesses in such a way that it is far more eco-friendly than what it was twenty, thirty years ago. And many businesses are doing that by choice. That is great, we appreciate them, but still that's not the way to do it. The policy should make sure whatever business you run is beneficial to everybody. That is the business of the policy makers. It is very important policy makers should plug all those holes which allows business to exploit that. Because within the framework of the policy, a uh, business is supposed to play a smarter game than its competition. If you don't allow them that, if, if both of us are running a business, if I tell her, you must be good, and I will make profit. This is not going to work, all right? Both of us are striving to make profit. Only if we break the framework of law, then there is a penalty for that. Within the framework of law, we are making money, that should not be a problem. The moment you question that, you are questioning the fundamental framework of the world's economy itself. Don't do that because that will lead to a much greater problem. Whenever something is inconvenient, you start throwing stones at somebody. This is not a good thing to do, this is a complete no-no. If you think a particular law is allowing businesses to do unjust things upon people or damaging... let us not even use the word unjust, damaging things to the world, we must tend to the law, fix the law in such a way that such activity cannot happen. As a part of this, now uh, I'm addressing in the COP15 by UNCCD. This is a... Uh, uh, professor should know the aspects behind this. See, climate... climate change and global warming and this carbon fuels, this uh, fossil fuel burning, this gets ninety-seven percent of the attention and the budget. Only three percent goes towards soil. So COP15, COP26 you heard all over the place, COP15 is happening. I participated in COP14 and now it's COP15 in Ivory Coast. During this journey I'm taking a two-day two break and going to 
Ivory Coast and I'm addressing 170 nations. We are quite certain because UNCC is a strong partner, plus the other uh, uh, UN agencies, we are quite certain some kind of policy agreement will happen towards soil because what we are offering or what we are asking for is so simplistic, nobody can say no to it. What I am saying is, this is all, three to six percent organic content should be there in the soil. Does anybody, a scientist, a politician, a businessman, a farmer, anybody, do they disagree with this? No, everybody agrees. How? Well, there are arguments. How to do it? Well, let's debate the how. But first, uh, let us agree, within the next eight to ten years' time, all agricultural soils on the planet must have three to six percent organic content. How you do it in each country, according to what is available there, their economic capabilities, soil conditions, people's will to do it, all this will decide how and how will also decide how long does it take. I feel well-to-do nations should be able to do it in six to eight years comfortably. Poorer nations should be able to do it in fifteen years. Very poor nations who have no means at all should be able to do it in twenty years' time. It's very much possible this plan can be drawn up. If this plan is drawn up, execution will happen at different paces in different nations, but the world should start moving towards three to six percent organic content. As the uh, professor said, 0.3 percent in Africa, less than 0.5 percent in 62 percent of India's lands, okay? With 1.3 billion population, what is our plan if you go like this? So this is a global issue, this is not an individual nation's issue. So it has to be addressed globally by intention. By consensus, we must arrive at the intention. This minimum must happen everywhere. How? Let each nation arrive at it by themselves, because we cannot dictate how somebody should do their agriculture. There are many, many aspects attached to it. I have a question for... The microphone is off. Oh, no, it's off. I have a quick question. Does either of you know the percentage of organic content on German soil? No, I, I cannot say exactly, but it's probably somewhere around two to three percent. So it's, um, and, and that's a, a let's say, a, a, a privilege of being in the temperate northern hemisphere because there's more moisture, there's lower temperature, so soils, uh, even if you misbehave, tend to have higher organic matter. So that is a challenge on the savanna or in India uh, to, to maintain and build organic carbon. But the science shows that nothing hinders us to go from 0 0.3, 0 0.4, up to three, four percent. It can be done, but it needs clever, wise management. One of the most promising technologies, for example, is conservation agriculture, where you stop plowing because we have used plowing as a way of intensifying monocultures in agriculture where you turn the soil. But when you turn the soil, you burn carbon and you expose the soil to the sun. And this works quite well in Germany when it's colder but it doesn't work at all in, in intensive rainfall, tropical regions of the world. If you stop plowing and instead you build more uh, organic carbon in the soil by having legumes, by more intercropping, by more green matter, you can actually build carbon very quickly and every farmer knows that that is what makes my soil productive. So it's, it's a beautiful win-win strategy and, and this is what we need to see. And, and, and while I'm, I'm at it, just, 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 just to share with you the power of what Saguru just said. So soils, even if we've mismanaged them, include, in, in contains three times more carbon just in the first mm -hmm. one meter than the atmosphere. So the atmosphere we've loaded with so much carbon that we have caused 1.2 degrees Celsius warming, the warmest temperature on Earth since we left the last ice age, and we see the impacts with major, major increase in extreme events that is hitting economies everywhere in the world and humans everywhere. But the soils are so powerful that they have three times more carbon despite the fact that we've mismanaged them. If we would go down the route that Sadhguru uh, suggests, we would pick out roughly one billion tons of carbon per year and we globally emit nine. So, so more than 10% of the solution would be provided by managing the soils. 
and, and we win through better productivity of the soil for food. So it's, it's not a small thing. I mean, this is, this is going from 0 0.3 to 3 is a big item. Mm -hmm. Now, already people have been above the… on the chair, you need to go higher <laughs> All right. Yeah, please <laughs> Sadhguru, I have a wonderful young lady, she is six years old from Poland and she oh, oh, oh. has a very nice present for you. This oh, is Susie oh, oh. and this is Sadhguru. the name, is it? What's her name? What's your name? Susie. Susie. <laughs> Safe soil and in Polish, Raczumi Glebe. Is it right? I saw to Mama in the Okay. Raczumi Glebe. There we go. Raczumi Glebe. Anna, thank you. So Susie, it's a big honor. Thank you so much. Now we have a new Thank friend. You. Thank you very much. Okay, Susie, this is your applause. This is dein ganz, ganz großer Applaus. Everybody's clapping their hands for you. Susie, thank you. Okay. I will bring you back. Sadhguru, Tony, Professor Roxen, thank you a lot for a wonderful impact. I am deeply impressed, I said it as before. I think we are all really deeply impressed after a fantastic two hours night here in Berlin and um, the main thing for me, I will bring it back home with a sentence, ich nehme es mit nach Hause und ich glaube, das tun hoffentlich alle von euch, von uns genauso. Es beginnt in uns. It starts in ourselves and I think this is one of the most important thing we have to mention, we have to think every day about that fact. Dankeschön, dass ihr da seid. Vielen, vielen Dank für die brillante Energie. Bleibt noch einen Moment. Denn wir haben einen Song und gemeinsam mit euch wollen wir gerne diesen Song feiern. We have a song. Let's celebrate the song. Safe Soil All Together. Vielleicht aufstehen wäre schön. Die Plakate dazu. Und dann zum Schluss gemeinsam hier dieses Bild. Auch Sadhguru hat das entsprechende Bild. Oh. Professor Röckström muss gerade gehen. Thank you so much. Dankeschön. Die nächsten Termine warten. Tony, there is, brilliant job. There is Thank a, you a lot. There is a soil anthem that all of you... And here's the soil anthem now. With our band, we have this one. Everybody of us. Und vielleicht auch das aller, aller Wichtigste. Liebe Leute, macht jetzt von diesem Moment ein Foto. Postet es bei Social Media. Und hier sind die Bilder dazu, damit wir die Botschaft weiter hinaustragen in die Welt. Soil. Everybody is just soil body. Hey, you must do this now. You must do the jig. The magic of soil Deep 
depleted soils will not quench the fire of hunger. Unquenched hunger can burn the very world. This is a generational responsibility. Save soil. Let's make it happen. Soil man. <laughs> the next hundred days, next one hundred days, every day, at least ten to fifteen minutes, dedicate your time to enhance the message. As you promised these twelve hundred people, just yourself, without other cities, you must touch three to four billion people. Hello? You… these… 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 Uh, these phones, these instruments that you have in your hand, these are not just taking shots of your own mug, okay, all right? These are powerful instruments, if you use it right, you can change the world. This is the first time that such an opportunity is there with humanity, just let's say fifty years ago or even twenty-five years ago. We could never talk to the world, this is the first time. Many great beings have come, but when they spoke, hardly ten people heard. This is the first time every one of us can speak to the world, when we have this means, when we have these technologies and when we have the capability, if we don't do something that is so significant for us and for future generations, it shows that we just don't care enough, that's what it means. In our lives, if we do not do what we cannot do, there is no issue. But in our lives, if we do not do what we can do, we are a disaster. Are we a disaster? No! To save soil, let's make it happen. Thanks to… thanks to Tony, Professor and our… Matthias. What? Matthias. Matthias. Thanks to all of them for being here, wonderful to have you.